Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Sid, um, and we're going to talk about simx.el, which is a new way to say symbolic expression, and also a way to edit Lisp code. Um, so, a little bit of background is I'm actually I've been using I've used em I've used Vim for more than ten years, and I've been using Emacs for about a year now, and. Uh, yeah, so that's that's me, and uh, we'll talk about some code soon. So this is the rough outline of what we're going to talk about. There's actually a lot of things, so we'll probably decide to narrow and focus based on what people want to do and things like that. Uh, but rough outline is what is a Simex, um, some background motivation, and then Simex one is actually based on a domain-specific language, and we'll talk about the DSL a little bit and how it's implemented and the interface to how you use this package to edit Lisp code. And then we'll, if, if there's time, we'll talk about some generalizations of this paradigm and um, go into some next steps and um, how you could be involved if you're interested in this kind of stuff. First of all, what is a SimX? A little bit of history here is a little while ago, I was um, talking to my partner, Ariana, over here about Lisp. And I was saying, oh, Lisp is so awesome, it's so great, and we have these sexps and these S expressions, and she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, you know, S expression, it's, it's pretty straightforward, it stands for symbolic expression. And she was like, without even missing a beat, she was like, why not just call it a Simex? And I was like, wait a second, hold on. You mean we've been doing Lisp for like 60 years and nobody has thought of using Simex instead of sexp or S expression? So it turns out I googled it and I can't actually find any instances of people using Simex for symbolic expression. Um, and instead we have you know the Lisp good old cast of characters, notorious um, people, you know, populists of uh, of Lisp. You have Kant's the little car that could you know. Uh, <laughs> that's a well-known Lisp bumper sticker. Um, and then let's not forget Herr Progen the Archduke of Hamburg. Um, so these are all kind of like Lisp terms that are pretty esoteric, but everybody who programs Lisp has gotten used to it. Um, so yeah, so symbolic expression. Um, Simex is a way to say symbolic expression as an alternative to some of these other ones already in use and some possible alternatives that no one has yet suggested, like the last one in that list. Uh, but anyway, so that's the origin of the term Simex, and it is a Emacs package. Also, in addition to being a way of saying symbolic expression, and the Emacs package is a way of editing Lisp code and writing Lisp code. So, what is Simex mode? A little bit of uh, motivation on what, what it is and how it works is this idea of structural editing. So, a lot of people come to um, Lisp and they initially find that it's harder to write code in Lisp because of the syntax. They see all of these parentheses and, you know, like ed editing code with a bunch of parentheses where you have to manage the parentheses and balance the parentheses is pretty hard. It's definitely an overhead and it does add a challenge over and beyond what people already have to do to write code in a language like Python or Ruby or something like that. So that's why you have this idea of structural editing, which um, you know, there are packages, probably was pioneered by packages like par edit and lispy and um, similar packages, which keep your parentheses balanced and allow you to do some structural operations on your code um, that allow you to like add and remove elements in a structural way instead of in a textual way. So structural editing is kind of a, a big precursor to this. And in fact, the thing is, what is initially more challenging about a Lisp is that you have all these parentheses and you have to balance all of those things to keep the structure. But in fact, the fact that the structure is explicit in Lisp allows us to write tools that take advantage of it that can make editing and writing Lisp code easier than writing code in other languages like Python. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the motivations of Simex of EL is it is a structural editing tool, just like par edit and Lispy, but it has a different approach, and the approach is that it provides a domain-specific language for describing tree operations, tree traversals, tree manipulations and computations, like reasoning about trees, and it provides a modal interface that allows you to use that. Um, so you have the language, 
you describe a bunch of traversals and operations and things like that. And the ones that are the most useful, you can use those and map them to a modal interface that's similar to Vim. So my background, as I mentioned, is that I have uh, more experience with Vim in my, uh, you know, in my usage. So yeah, modal interface. And, and I'll motivate modal interfaces a little bit more. I want to sell the idea of a modal interface, I think, to Emacs users as well. Because there are some conceptual reasons, some foundational reasons why we might all want to consider modal interfaces. Not because of how they look now, but because of how they might look over time. So yeah, so that, these are the two components of Simex.el. So this is now, we'll go into an annotated demo, and I say annotated because that's a reminder to me that demos can be hard to follow when you look at people doing magical mumbo jumbo. So this is a reminder to me to say what I'm doing, and if you have any questions or something seems unclear, then please stop me and let me know, and we can slow down and explain what's happening. Okay, so this is my Emacs buffer, and we have, actually, let's go to a, so this is an, Loud. Should I mute the speaker? Yes, I should. There's no reason to have audio. What? Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, so this is my Emacs buffer, and this is an elist file. So we're going to enter Simex mode, and don't worry too much about everything right now because we'll go into things in detail later. This is more kind of a workflow example of how it actually looks in practice, how you would use this thing. So this is now Simex mode and we have on the screen here uh, some elementary Lisp code. And we can navigate it not as a text buffer, but we're navigating it here as a tree. We're going back and forth between different rooted trees and we can evaluate things as we go. Um, it's a little small at the bottom there, but if you look all the way down at the mode line, the Emacs uh, output messaging line, you'll see that we are evaluating these Simexes as we go. Uh, we can also evaluate this expression, and it says, you know, the sum of all of these numbers is six, and you can enter these, go forward and backward. Actually, I'm going to add, let's see if this works, yes. So now you can see what I'm typing. That should make this a little bit better. Take it in, left and right. And one of the things that's uh, key about the interface of Simex mode is that it uses spatial intuitions. So in Vim, we um, use HJKL for navigating. I think everybody's had some familiarity with that. H is left and right and up and down are the other things. So that's kind of how you navigate them here. H and L to go left and right across trees, and J to go down into a tree, K to go up out of a tree. So you go down, forward, 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 and you try to go forward again, it doesn't let you, because it's strict about the hierarchy of the tree. So it says this, these are all the nodes at this level of the tree, and you can't go past them. So you go down again, forward and backwards, and you can evaluate expressions as you go by hitting E, E for E eval. So that's five, four, three, and then you back out of this, and that gives you the product of those numbers. You back out of this, it gives you the product of those numbers, and you evaluate. And similarly, you can evaluate other expressions. Is, is the result going in the mini buffer? I actually can't see it. Yeah, it's actually going all the way at the bottom there. Oh, okay. And do, you, do you use a package called zoom frame? Zoom up around? I do not. Yeah. So we can zoom inside this thing, but it doesn't zoom the bottom. Um, if you zoom, zoom up around, uh, you will actually do that. Well, another possibility, you could try it something like this. Ooh. But then you don't see what we're evaluating. <laughs> okay, Are you using uh, your own config or? That so was this is not space max, right? This, this is no, this is just my own. Uh, Right, um, so the, yeah, that's kind of roughly the navigation and evaluation of things. We'll come back to this ladder thing later. Do um, you use use package? Yes. So let's, let's do this. Uh, I mean, it will, it will simplify things. Uh, so you type, uh, just, this is Emacs Lisp, right? Uh huh. Uh, type use package, um, and let me, let me 
pretty sure of that. Um, the name of the package Zoom uh, FRM. Yeah. And you can do like um, ensure. Yeah. That should download it. And then you can delete. Unavailable. Is it FRM? Zoom. Oh, it's not an alpha. That's So um, it should be fine, I think. Uh, and I'll, I'll like explain what the evaluation results are. Uh, okay, so we'll come back to this this later thing in a bit. But in the meantime, let us. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, we haven't really done the allocated demo. Okay, so here is a Racket program. Racket is a dialect of Lisp. It's a dialect of Scheme actually, which follows in the tradition of um, SICP or SICP, I don't know how it's pronounced, structure and interpretation of computer programs, like scheme and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so Racket is great, it's really nice. Um, um, but yeah, so this is a Racket program which prints, which outputs Pascal's triangle. And so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna enter some X mode, we're gonna evaluate all these statements one by one. We don't have to do it that way, but we will. Um, Okay, so you have the racket REPL on the right-hand side there. Now, Pascal's triangle, um, is, uh, if you guys don't already know, it is just kind of a, it's a triangle that has this property that every subsequent row is um, obtained by summing pairs of elements from the previous row. So the first few rows of Pascal's triangle look like this. Okay, so we have a program here that um, in that outputs Pascal's triangle. So you can see we enter some X mode, we can evaluate this entire function. And now maybe we want to test this function. So we say split into pairs, we give it a sample list. And then again, we're back in some X mode, we hit evaluate, and the output is on the right side there. Go to the next and next, we evaluate this one. That is the actual function that gives us Pascal's triangle. And notice it takes in two arguments. The first is the required argument of the number of rows. And the second is the is how is a function that will render the element of Pascal's triangle to the screen, which by default is just numbered string. Oh, um, so I Well, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So, um, so yeah, this is just to bring you up to speed. We're doing a demo of the next one, and this is a program that outputs Pascal's triangle. And so we're just like going through it to see how it looks and like a general workflow example before we start talking about things in detail. Okay, so Pascal's triangle, this is a function that takes in 
the two arguments, and uh, yeah, we, the first argument is the number of rows of Pascal's triangle we want to output, and the second one is how we want to render each element of the triangle, which is a number, and we just convert it to a string by default. So we evaluate that function, and now let's say we want to test it, so we can write it here and say Pascal 5. We run it, we get five rows of Pascal's triangle. Um, but now instead of just rendering it as a string, maybe we want to render it graphically using a function that, if it's odd, returns a star uh, or outputs a star and otherwise outputs a space. So you evaluate that and then we run Pascal, the function again, um, you know, and it, it does that. So basically, you know, this is just how we would go about using the thing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we can have a selector. And I don't know if, if it's very clear what I'm doing here, but I'm going through navigating these expressions as if they were trees by going up and down, spatially navigating the symbolic expressions and evaluating as I go and making changes that way. I was actually going to like code these up live, but I don't know if we have a lot of time, so we're just going to, yeah, anyway. So yeah, this is Pascal's triangle, and actually, we're outputting multiples of seven. It should look different. Yeah, okay. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, multiples of six or something. Yeah, pretty cool, right? It looks nice. But anyway, yeah. this is beside the point. It's more just a demo of a, a non-trivial application that you might write and edit and manipulate using sim Simex mode. Um, and it's really, um, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so annotated example is done. And we will continue with that. But any questions so far, by the way, about how, how we navigate symbol symbolic expressions using Simex mode, or how we evaluate things, or how we edit things, or anything like that? Well, yes, lots. Uh, lots of yeah. questions, okay. Um. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get into more details as we go, but um, feel, feel free to ask questions now. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I came late, so I was just gonna yes, how do you navigate uh, trees? And right, <laughs> so it is Vim-inspired, mm -hmm. so the spatial intuitions that you use to navigate some X's, they're called some X's, by the way, like symbolic expressions. Yeah. No, I, I, read the, I read the thing. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so the, the spatial intuitions are, for a Vim user, they would be completely natural, and for an Emacs user, they would be something that you would just slightly have to learn. And I would recommend, I think, uh, learning about modal interfaces uh, for Emacs users as well. But basically, it's 8JKL to go, so if you're inside a Simax like this, you go down by hitting J, and then um, L goes forward, and we've gone as far forward as we can in this particular SEMEX. So we go down again, forward, 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 forward. We've gone as far forward as we can, down, forward, back, forward, back, up, 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 down, down, and so on. So it's HAKL is the up, down, left, right. Okay. When, when you say go, go forward mm -hmm. in it, and like I can't go forward anymore, I can go down. Yes. I'm Thinking this makes sense if you think of it as a tree, but it's not entirely obvious exactly. you're saying, like, you know, what, what that means. So maybe I'm not very smart, but it's, I mean. No, no, no. We'll, yeah, that's a good, good point. So we'll, we'll come back to that. It is strict in, when we say up, down, and forward, and backward, it is strict about that. It goes yeah, yeah. at the same level, or it goes above and up and down one level. But, oh, it's, oh. yeah, in the level of the tree. But, there is, I mean, a lot of times you just want to go through the whole thing and you don't want to go at one particular level. Like intuitively, you just want to like see the next thing. And we'll come to that in a moment um, or a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, so basically this, this is just a superficial um, example of a workflow using Simex1. And it understands vectors, not just parentheses, right? The vectors like the square brackets and stuff. Yes, to an extent. Uh, there are some syntactic issues, but I'll get to that as well at the, towards the end of the talk. Okay, so a background in the approach that we're using here is, is a domain-specific language, as you mentioned. Um, so whenever you talk about DSLs, 
or whenever you talk about languages in, in general, you generally talk about these two things, which is syntax and semantics. And syntax is how the language looks on the surface. Um, what are the symbols that you're using to designate various ideas in the language? So syntax is just purely a bunch of surface level strings that are meaningless by themselves. Um, and semantics is the interpretation of those symbols. Like how do these, um, so for instance, you know, you have a real domain that you're looking at, you know, it could be semaxes or it could be like a real world situation of some kind. And you have real interactions, real entities in that particular environment that have certain relationships between them. They interoperate and like various things happen and they behave in certain ways. Now you're familiar with that without needing a language of any kind. But you use a language so that you can represent those things um, to other people, for instance. Um, and the way that you do that is you have some syntax which is completely meaningless by itself, but you decide on certain syntactic relationships between elements of that syntax, which the way that those work somehow captures the relationships that you really experience about the real domain that you're talking about. And so the syntactic relationships map to the real relationships that exist underneath, and that the way that correspondence is achieved is the, sema is the semantics of the language. So you're saying basically it doesn't have to be a typically symbolic expression; it can be used as a like in regular like you know knowledge languages as well. So this is just DSLs in general. This is not about semantics specifically. Uh, this is DSLs in general have this idea of syntax uh, and semantics. Okay. But in um, but Simex in particular is uh, DSL for symbolic expressions specifically. But yeah, so uh, the idea of syntax and semantics is not specific to DSLs or computer languages. It is you know even like human languages have uh, syntax and semantics, and just like English and Japanese and other such languages, human languages are languages for the rich world of experience, which we really experience and see the real entities and the real interactions between them. In the same way you can think of Vim, again, we're coming back to Vim because I want to talk about modal interfaces and um, you know, things like that. We'll, we'll see more about that, but Vim you can think of as a DSL for the world of text. So if your world was not so rich as this real world that we inhabit and it, all it had in it was the things that are interesting from a text point of view, paragraphs, words, sentences, lines, pages, files, then you don't really need a language that has such a big vocabulary. You know, in English we have words that are, you know, 15 or 20 letters long because we have so many things in our world that we need words that are long enough to express all of these different possibilities. So for instance, you know, there's like foxinos and helicolification and things like that. They're just really absurdly long words because those are just you know, ex exceptional things. Can you say that one again? Foxy, Nas, and Hilotilification. Maybe don't say it again. What does it mean? <laughs> it means when you condescend at somebody or you treat Are you using big words? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, no, not exactly. Not actually, but, but yeah, might as well be <laughs> that. Uh, but yeah, so you have really long words in English because you have a really rich world of experience. But when you're talking about the world of text, you don't need, your words can be really short. And as it turns out, Vim's words are one letter long. Because there's, you don't need that many nouns in the world of text. We have 26 letters to play with, and we only need like six or seven. So we have really short words, the single character words that are the nouns, single character words that are the verbs. And, uh, but you know, you, but it still ends up, Vim still ends up using your whole keyboard and um, it still is something that you have to ex explicitly learn. It's not something that you can use your existing intuitions um, immediately with. So Vim is something that you have to learn. Just like Emacs is something that you have to learn. So I asked the question, or we should ask the question, is this world still too big? What if we think even smaller than the world of text? And so we come to the Simex DSL, which is just like Vim was a DSL for the world of text, 
Simex is the DSL for the world of Simexes, or symbolic expressions. Um, so again, did you know that squirrels spend most of their time navigating a tree-structured space? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually though, <laughs> but more, but seriously, I, I sit in my apartment working on some of these things and I look outside my window, there's a roof of the neighboring house and there's a tree rising next to the house and I see these squirrels running around all the time, chasing each other, climbing up on the, the tree, jumping off the tree onto the roof. It's, really impressive what squirrels can do. But even squirrels, with all of their abilities, still can't do everything. And if they see a fruit on a distant branch on the tree, they need to figure out the best, the fastest way of getting there because they can't jump there in one leap. So I want you to put yourself in the mind of the squirrel because that is what we're gonna do as we think about this DSL. We think about this DSL as what would the squirrel use? for navigating a tree. And so the DSL has three components. There's navigations, there's transformations, and there's computations. Navigations means moving around in a tree. Transformations means manipulating the tree. So you're like adding or removing nodes, promoting a node to a parent or a child, or like, you know, deleting a node or something like that. And computations is something that we won't really talk much about, but you could you know, traverse the tree and do various kinds of computations based on the traversal that you did. Like for instance, how deep this tree is or something like that. But we don't really have a lot of use cases for that at the moment, so we won't talk about it much. So as far as navigations goes, the Simex DSL introduces six primitives. And the first of these is called move. This is the most elementary thing that you do in a Simex DSL. You just move from one node to a neighboring node. So you could go to the, you know, this is what we saw earlier with 8JKL, go forward, backward, up and down. That's a move. But sometimes you want to do a maneuver, which is a sequence of moves that you execute in order. So you say, go forward, then go up, then go forward again, then go down, and then go forward three times. And that is a maneuver. Then you have a circuit, which is do this thing, a certain number of times or forever as long as it keeps until it stops working so keep going forward until you can't go forward anymore as a circuit it's a loop basically and then you have a precaution which is um, checking a certain condition which you can specify what that condition is before you do the traversal and checking another condition after you complete the traversal and if either of those conditions doesn't hold then you abort the traversal and you don't do anything um, and then a protocol is um, trying many different things and doing the first one that works. So unlike a maneuver which is doing things in sequence and doing them all, so do this, then do this, then do this, protocol is do this and if that doesn't work then try this and if this doesn't work then try this. So that's a protocol. Uh, so you can think of it as a choice, like do the first one that works. And lastly, we have detour, which is do this, but if that doesn't work, then take this detour and then do the same, try that again. So this is the thing that you want to do, but if you can't do it, then here's your reorientation step that you can do and keep trying to do that thing as long as the reorientation doesn't fail. So that's a detour. So the idea is in this image, particular image here, the squirrel wants to go forward, but for some reason it's not able to, so the, the reorientation says go out and come back in and then try again. Of course, in this case, it doesn't make any sense because the squirrel would be able to go forward in that case. Um, so, okay, we'll have a quick demo of what this looks like in the code. Uh, any questions so far about anything? Okay, so this is how we define, um, so using the linguistic primitive we just talked about, we can describe arbitrary traversals. Actually not completely arbitrary, there are some limitations to the types of traversals we can describe. But one of the ones we can describe is um, the pre-order traversal and post-order traversal. These are standard tree traversal algorithms. If you've ever been job hunting, you've probably gotten some questions related to pre-order and post-order traversals. Um, but yeah, so standard algorithms for navigating trees. 
And it turns out that when you're navigating a Simex, the intuitive, obvious way that you want to navigate it, if you're just going through it in order, turns out to be a pre-order traversal. So if you want to look at everything, you want to say, okay, I want to go to this one, then I want to go to this one, then I want to go to this one, then this one, then this, then this, then this, then this. And I did all of those steps manually to illustrate what I wanted to happen. Um, but this pre-order traversal is uh, a description of that in an algorithm. So we say, it turns out that the way you describe that using the Simex language is you say, keep trying to first try to go in, and if you can't go in, then go forward. Um, you know what, let me set, set Q, Simex, highlight P, true, let's see if that, okay, good. So, um, yeah, so the way that you do a pre-order traversal is you say, try to go in, and if that doesn't work, then go forward, and if that doesn't work either, then, um, then try to go out, as long as you don't hit the root, or sorry, the, the final simex of the entire buffer, so you want to keep traversing some X's all the way till you hit the end of the file. And um, yeah, so go out and then take a detour and try to go forward after that. And if that works, then start from the beginning all over again. So each step, this entire thing is executed where it says it tries to go in, if that fails, it tries to go forward, if that fails, it tries to go out as long as it doesn't hit the final some X of the file. And if that's still good, then it goes forward and it tries to go in again. And this entire traversal is mapped to the key F, which means forward in Cinemax mode. And likewise, there is a post-order traversal, which is mapped to the key B for going back. And so we can try these out now by going to Cinemax mode and hit F, 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 F. And it's just going through everything in the intuitive order that we would want to go through everything. And then you can hit B, 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 and it just reverses it. And these are pre-order and post-order traversals, it turns out. Um, so yeah, that is how those things work. Um, any questions on any of that so far? I have tons of questions, but I don't want to jump ahead. OK. Okay, you could you could ask some questions, and if it's some, if it's something I want to cover later, then I'll I'll mention that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean we probably will be like covering slurping, like transpo transposing, it's like and the uh, barping, um, yes. all that stuff, right? Yes, we will actually. So, uh, see so yeah, navigations, and then exactly that's a great lead into our next slide, which is transformation. So we talked about navigations. The second component was transformations, and that is that is this. So for instance, you might want to add a new node to the Simex. Um, you might want to emit or capture, which is also called barf and slurp, or yeah, barf and slurp. Um, raise Simex. And then these are some other things that um, are standard. Most of these are standard, so you guys are probably, if you edit Lisp code, you're probably already familiar with most of these things. Um, but yeah, we, we can do all of those things. And in fact, we can do all of those things because we are actually using Power Edit and Lispy and Evil Clever Parents and other Emacs tools that have already been written which do those things. And so uh, the, the reason is that Simex mode's lowest level of the actual operations that it provides is made up of black box abstractions which are currently fulfilled by these existing Emacs packages. And that's fine for now. It works and it's good and it's great, you know. But it is there's a difference between being very good and being 100% reliable, which is coming back to a question you were asking earlier, Ag, about like syntactically does it handle all the cases of like box brackets and things like that, right? So it turns out that relying on par edit and lispy and evil clever parents for all of these foundational operations is good because it works in the majority of cases 
but I'm not aware if they use an explicit AST representation or not. Uh, but in any case, SIMX mode needs that at some point in order to be 100% reliable. Um, and so that is one of the planned additions is to have an explicit AST representation of the code you're editing along with the correspondence to the actual buffer and point positions of each of the individual components of the SIMX. Now, the good news is that this is going to be relatively easy to implement because how do you get an AST in Lisp versus other languages? You just had a quote in front of the, the code, right? It's, <laughs> it's just data. It's, it's just, yeah. Data. There you go, code is data. So you just literally put a quote in front of the, the code and you've got your AST and then you can, you know, then you have to worry about the buffer correspondence. But the hard problem is solved, so this shouldn't be too bad to implement at some point. Um, it's interesting, sorry, I'm no, no, uh, no. Segue into, it's interesting, Lisp existed for a very long time, right? I mean, you have Lisp, like, and it's one of those non-dying languages, it's like, it's hard to kill. <laughs> and it seems like only recently, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe there were, like, attempts before, but, like, recently it feels like there's a, like came an explosion of like all different ways to like to do structural editing with Parit, Parantar, uh Sean the Bond done like you know pretty pretty amazing work on that front and like you know um now there's Lispy, Lispy Will or Lisp Lisp people. I don't Lispy know. Lispy I've seen yeah. it around, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's uh uh the, the one Space Max uh Lisp State. There's evil, evil list or something like that. Yeah, I, have, I haven't tried all of those. I've, I've tried many of them. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, not at all. It's, it's just interesting. I think we're like, you know, coming. Lisp is coming back. It feels like Lisp is definitely like, you know, it's. We, people realize that Lisp is still. Um, it's, it's a good language and it's like, you know, very pragmatic language. Yeah, for or, sure. Like, uh, Lisp is not a language. Interestingly though, um, in the Racket mailing list I just saw recently that they're planning on, like the next iteration of Racket is going to be non-symbolic expression based, which sounds kind of interesting. I don't know how that's going to be, but, but yeah, I mean, symbolic expressions obviously like are great in many ways and people are seeing that and it's coming back. And like a lot of research has happened in Lisp that hasn't really gone into other languages yet. Think um, like continuations and macros and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, so traversals, right? So traversals with side effects. This is another interesting thing. First of all, let me remove the highlighting. We talked about traversals. You can do a pre-order, post-order traversal, or whatever kind of traversal that you want. But what if you want to traverse something, and also while traversing, you want to do some side effect? Um, so one possible use case for this is this thing that we saw earlier. Let's zoom out a little bit. And actually, let us close this. Okay, so this. This is like a, let's say you copy pasted this code from somewhere and it's just really <coughs> poorly indented for some reason. And you want to say, okay, let me select this entire thing and auto indent it, right? So you hit auto indent and that's what happens. That's what it was, that's what it is. Not a huge improvement. And the reason for that is that the auto indent feature doesn't understand this code structurally. It looks, it understands the lines, but it doesn't understand the structure. So instead, what you'd really like to do 
is you'd like to traverse the SIMX po in a post-order way. And the reason that's important is because you want to indent things from the bottom up. You want to like get everything at the low levels indented and then reconcile those with the higher levels. So if we could do a post-order traversal of the SIMX and have it indent as a side effect at each step. Then that should do what we're looking for. And in SIMX mode, there is a feature mapped to meta equal. Equal is indent, which just did what we saw earlier. But if you do meta equal, it's going to go through and indent it um, with the traversal side effect. So that's what it was, that's what it is. It's completely indented. Another possible use case for something like this um, could be. So let's say you have this code and you want to evaluate it. So you evaluate it, it gives you 26. You evaluate this and let's put that in. And you get this big figure 16,128. But if you're someone who's learning Lisp for the first time, you might want to know exactly how it's arriving at that figure and you might want to like look at every step as it's happening. And it turns out that if you do a post-order traversal of this and have evaluate as a side effect, that you can see every step that the interpreter itself, like the Lisp interpreter, would do um, to get the result. So you do that, which is, so E is evaluate, as we know, and meta E is evaluate with traversal. So if we look at what this looks like, you see it's getting it's going through these step by step first it gets one then it gets three then it says this is a uh, procedure called square the square of three is nine and then this is a procedure called minus and uh, nine minus one is eight and so it's going hierarchically up this tree evaluating as a side effect which is called tree accumulation in lisp interpreters which is actually how the lisp interpreter works um, so it's kind of really useful. I find it very useful for learning Lisp, like to see every expression being evaluated and like how it arrives at its result and things like that. Um, so yeah, that is um, traversals with side effect. Um, is, is one of the possibilities that you can do with Simex. Yeah, I wonder if like you know possibilities probably to, uh, while micro expanding. you have a macro and you want to expand to certain like levels. You know, like you can expand macro, but then like if you have a macro within the macro, like you know, you, you can either expand all the levels or you can go like, you know, go by level. Mm. This, is, this is interesting. Maybe. It's like it opens like certain possibilities. Mm. Yeah, oh, nice. Mm. So yeah, we talked about the DSL so far, and now the second component, the two components of Simex.el are the DSL and the modal interface. So now we'll talk a little bit about the modal interface, which as we know is inspired by Vim. Um, so Emacs versus Vim, the age old holy war, you know. <laughs> but actually Emacs and, Vifer, and Vim are fairly different. Um, they differ in at least three ways. First of all, they differ in their nature. One is a platform, primarily, that is Emacs, and one is primarily a language specification, which is Vim. Um, they differ linguistically, where Emacs's command model is basically noun verbs. So you say forward Simex, backward Simex, you know, kill word, kill sentence, kill paragraph. It's all one thing, right? So nouns and verbs are not separated. Whereas linguistically in Vim, the grammar is verb, article, and noun. So you say delete three paragraphs, change this word, or something like that. And they also differ referentially, where in Emacs you're actually doing things. You're down there, you like m go around back and forth doing all the different things. You never need to exit any mode or anything like that. Like everything you do is actually happening. 
Whereas in, in Vim, you're not actually doing things, you're talking about doing things. You're issuing commands. And as a side effect of these commands being issued, the work is actually happening. So they differ in these three different, in at least these three different ways. Um, and Simex's interface is inspired by the modal nature, and we'll see why that is as we go. But how it works is like this. Instead of going manually between Simex's, we refer to Simex's as we edit them. Um, we don't worry about the textual representation, so you're never thinking about opening parentheses, closing parentheses, you're never thinking about spaces, you're all in when you're in Simex mode, your point is never not going to be referring to some Simex. It's always going to be referring to some node in the tree because it is not thinking in terms of text, it's thinking in terms of the tree, in theory. Um, and so, um, and another feature of the Simex modal interface is unlike Vim, where you have the verb, noun, and article grammar, and you can you know, use different verbs and different nouns and different articles at any time. In Simex mode, at the present time, you fix the noun. You're saying you are talking about Simexes. You're not talking about words. You're not talking about paragraphs or anything. You're talking about Simexes. And so the noun is always fixed. You don't have articles right now. You just have verbs. So you just are manipulating the known nouns, which is Simexes, using a whole collection of verbs. Um, and now, so the Simex mode is implemented as a modal interface, or it has a modal, it provides a modal interface. So you would think that we should use evil for this purpose, because evil is Vim inside Emacs, and evil is a modal interface, so you would think we should use evil. And I think that's right, like long term, we should use evil, but unfortunately, um, it seems like evil might be hard coded for Vim style motions at the moment, instead of like, if I want to introduce a Simex motion, like forward Simex or backward Simex, it seems like it may not currently be able to handle that in a straightforward way. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I just wasn't able to get it to work properly, but it's possible that um, we might need to change the verb behavior of evil in order to support this properly, or maybe like I can just implement a hack of some kind to get it to work. So in the short term, the modal interface is implemented using Hydra. Which turns out Hydra is kind of like it's a menu-driven interface for like various things, but it turns out Hydra is a really good modal interface as well. You enter a Hydra and now you're in a whole different mode. And it provides all of these different exit points for how you can exit the mode into your Emacs state or your Vim state or whatever. Um, but the, the shortcoming is Hydra is a modal interface, but it is not a linguistic interface like Vim is. So that's the only thing that we lose. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Jeff? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay. Ish. Okay, so in that case, we'll talk, we'll show a little demo of um, sort of generalizing the ideas that we've talked about here. Um, this is not something, so Simex mode, by the way, is on Melpa. It's been on Melpa for a few days now, so if you want to download it, you can. <laughs> but is that your first mode? Is that first one? Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. Sid, I, I have a question uh, related to like Hydro versus Evil. That means that you cannot use like. Uh, it's actually broken, just FYI. What is? So you can't install it off of Melba. I mean, it's there, but you can't install it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, really? I'll file one before I have <laughs> Okay. <laughs> to like, uh, to. Two semixes forward or like backwards. You can do you cannot that. do that, yeah. Like like in Vim, right? Exactly. So you can just say this semix. Always you're referring to one semix. I think it's it's possible, like, you know, you you'd have to use the the arguments, uh, the universal arguments of Vim. Mm -hmm. Like in in Emacs. I see. I mean it's always possible in Emacs. <laughs> it's true. It's, I, 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 I'm a I'm a diehard Vimmer myself, but one day I woke up and realized you might still actually be Yeah, evil is really nice. Um, yeah, the only yeah, 
it's definitely. I mean, I I, I love evil and I love um, I love yeah, I, I I I see that what you're doing, and I see like I and I see how difficult it is to explain what's happening there without like you know without you have to try yourself. It's like you have to feel it. Um, it's it's hard to explain to somebody who's not. Familiar with yeah, maybe so. Emotions. It's, sorry, but this is this is really good. Oh, thank you. Uh, but yeah, so. This is um, a demo. By the way, I haven't I haven't tried this at all, so hopefully it'll work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so so far we've talked about Simex mode as one modal interface for the world of Simexes, where we took all of them, which is this world of text, and we said let's not talk about the world of text that's too big. It includes Simexes. You know, symbolic expressions are text, but Vim's world is too big, and that's why it's cumbersome to discuss to work with Simexes in Vim. I mean, maybe it isn't. I don't know. There's probably some for plugins or something like that. But Simex mode makes the world smaller and says Vim just for Simexes. So let's take that idea and generalize it a little bit, and say, what if we had um, small modal interfaces that are modular and specific to each particular thing that are very specific, and you dis and you integrated them into a framework that had relationships between these different modes. Then what might that look like? And that might look like this, where currently we are in, um, let's see here, C, D, okay. So now we're in normal Vim here. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, which is unfortunately kind of small, we're currently in normal mode of Vim. And Typically, you would get into insert mode of them by hitting I or by hitting A or something like that. Um, but I uh, have mapped enter to go into insert mode and escape to go back to normal mode. So enter, escape, enter, escape. It goes from normal mode to insert mode, normal mode to insert mode. But we can go into um, so the you know the modal relationships and things like that. We can have this new way of representing the modes. Um, so that you can see them in a, in a structure. And so this is kind of what we're looking at, actually. When we say enter and escape, and we're going between insert and normal mode, we actually are envisioning a tower. Like, that's the kind of conceptual model that we're using. And we could also alternatively just select which one we want to go to and hit enter, and we're now in insert mode. And we go to normal, and we're now in normal mode. But in addition to this tower, we could also have alternative towers, such as this tower, which may look familiar. This is Emacs, where Vim is, and uh, so the terminology here you know, should be improved, but at the moment I call this an epistemic tower, just because it was loosely inspired by some research that I was doing, which has that term. But epistemic just means knowledge, so we have these two levels here, and this is Vim. So this is Vim represented as a tower. And this is Emacs represented as a tower. And now if you go to Emacs, um, now you're actually in Emacs mode. So you can just like type things, control A, control E, control N, control P, and all that stuff. This is Emacs. Um, but we can go back into this mode and select a completely different tower and say, you know what? Instead of just having insert on normal mode, like my normal Vim, I want to have Simex mode in between my normal and my insert mode because often when I'm in insert mode and typing things when I hit escape I don't want to go to normal mode I want to go to simex mode because I'm operating on simexes right now and so you do that and then you say you know what I'm done with simexes I want to write a comment right now so you start writing a comment and maybe you're editing a bunch of comments and you don't want to be in simex mode anymore so you hit escape one more time and now you're back in Vim's normal mode and you can do like, you know, Vim stuff. So this is Vim, this is not Simex mode anymore. And there could be many other such towers. Simex Lisp tower is one, uh, Emacs is another that we saw, Vim is another that we saw, and then you could also oh, have, yeah, we could have a whole bunch of different modes. Um, so you could have uh, like word mode, for instance. Let's put a bunch of words here. And now you're in a mode that's 
actually we're in character mode right now but yeah this is a mode that's entirely dedicated to words so you go and you say i want to move this word to the left move this word to the left move this word to the right i'm going to look up this word in the dictionary actually no that wasn't the right one uh, hold on. okay where's word mode okay word mode so you want to look up this word in the dictionary let's put a real word actually What's a good word? Um, esoteric. We talked about just now. Esoteric. Esotology. What's that? No, it's a terrible word. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the first one. So esoteric. You want to look it up in a dictionary because word. This mode is focused on words, and one of the things you might want to do with words is look at, look it up in a dictionary. And now we can go into view mode, which is another one of these levels in the tower. And this is one. This is a mode that's focused entirely around views. So you can zoom in and zoom out. And again, everything is spatial. It uses your spatial intuitions. So you're going forward and back into the page. Or like, as it turns out, you're going up and down, in and out, K and J, into the page. And you go right and left. So this is, this is your view that you're controlling. You're in view mode. Um, and then you can go to window, window mode. And window mode says, oh, you know, now we're in a sort of a domain specific language you could say about windows and so you can do blah 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 and you say i don't want this window anymore you know what uh, let's get rid of this window too let's make this window bigger let's make it taller and you know what actually i don't like this window anyway let's get rid of it let's get rid of that one and let's maximize this window and it's all single keystrokes because you've narrowed your space from Vim talking about all of these different things, from Emacs talking about literally everything, you've narrowed your space to just windows. And so you can just have single keystrokes because your vocabulary is so small that your words can be single letters long. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of some of the modes that are available here. Activity mode is another interesting one. This is a mode about your editing activity. So you can go backwards and forwards to places you've edited in the code, which is not so much about text as about your own actions. Um, and then there's character mode, you know, like if you want to move a little character around, do that you move this, well, I don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, you move, uh, I don't know what's happening. Anyway, <laughs> okay, I forget all the keys for character mode, I haven't used it in a long time. But the point is, character mode should, in theory, work the same as word mode or any other mode. And so that is the generalized version of Simex mode, you could say, is generalizing the idea of modal interfaces. Um, and why you might want to consider using modal editing, because it, as a conceptual model, has a lot of possibilities that I think we've only begun to explore. Um, yeah, and... Uh, that's it. So some next steps are to reevaluate the evil mode foundation. Currently, it seems like the side effects of evil mode are hard coded to Vim motions. So like moving by word or by sentence and so on, instead of moving by simax. And also, evil states are buffer specific, whereas some of the epistemic modes that we talked about are not buffer specific. Windows and buffer mode. And even beyond, you can have a mode for pretty much anything which doesn't even have to be related to text. Have you ever tried space mines? I have not, actually. You should. Because a lot of things, they cover there too, but they done it, uh, they built a bunch of hydras, but they call them transients, for all these uh, different, like, you know, things. So there's transient to, like, you know, to zoom frames, and, like, from zoom, zoom, and there's... And it's similar, like, okay. you, know, you, you, can, you can get into transit. There's a, like, a transient for a scrolling. Like, you can go, like, you know, you, you want by scroll by uh, pages, scroll by, like, you know, by paragraphs, scroll, like, you know, just, just by lines, mm -hmm. <clears throat> stuff like that. It's, okay. It's, it's pretty nice. It's yeah. similar ideas, but, like, you know, done differently. So I'd love see. to see your, like, you know, uh, your thoughts about it and try it and, like, and see how 
because this this is this is pretty cool stuff. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to try, actually. I, I, I mean to try. Um, I, I don't know, one, maybe one possible thing, uh, way in which this might be different is that the, uh, the intended idea here is that any evil mode can be used as one of these levels. So pretty much you or somebody else can write an evil mode for some particular domain, and then you can just incorporate it into this, epi this epistemic framework. It's just all like... Yeah, just give me a mode and that's it. It's just going to work out of the box. Modality is great because when you have modality, you don't need to think about uh, key bindings. Like, because you can get limited by, like, you know, number of key bindings you can uh, <clears throat> bind to keys. It's it's always limited, right? You can't, you, 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 you start, like, <clears throat> kind of running out of ideas for the keys, right? Yeah. So totally. I use uh, modality system-wide so um, I, I, everywhere so I, I, I can show you uh, after, after this talk uh, like how I do this yeah um, so I built um, there's a uh, in in OSX in on, in, on Mac I use Hammerstone mm -hmm. right uh, in Linux I use uh, ASWM uh, and X ASWM it's like it's basically window manager that uh, that's driven by Emacs, like virtually, like you know, your system basically. You e Emacs becomes your operating system. Mm. It's it's yeah, it's very interesting concept. You you, you get like you, you get things like I don't edit things, for example, in other applications. I, don't, I I can just like I can invoke Emacs, like you know, edit things there change modes, whatever, and like, yank it and put it like, you know, and go back and like, do certain things. I control the music, volume, uh, music, changing tracks with like, and I don't ever leave like AJKL. Uh, I always stay in the home row because, uh, yeah, why would you even ever? Yeah, that sounds similar where you're like using your same spatial intuition for different yeah. applications, right? So yeah. So to, to like move windows around, to reset exactly. them. Exactly, yep, yep. AJKL, but you yeah. just need to switch to different model, and like, yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. Find sense. S to top row mode, and D to bottom row mode, and you know, <laughs> that's basically all you need. Mm. Yeah, so, so next steps here, um, re revisit the evil mode foundation. Ideally, we want to use evil mode because I think that would make it the most modular and very lightweight. You know, you don't have to have like a crazy monolithic thing um, to have all of this functionality. You can have as much or as little of it as you want if it's an, if everything can be in evil mode um, or an evil state, I guess is the correct term for Emacs. Um, and the Hydra, you know, alternative to using evil is the limitation is that it's non-linguistic. Uh, which is fine if you're fixing your noun anyway, if you're saying that we're working with Symaxis or you're working with Windows, but then we'll have to figure out a way of incorporating articles like three Symaxis or something like that. And also at the moment, Hydra mandates having a menu. So you sometimes have, you have this giant Symax menu that fills up a third of your screen, which I never refer to because I know the keystrokes at this point. Uh, and I think when you use Symax mode, the idea is that eventually you won't need to refer to that. But of course, it's always nice to have that menu on, on demand if you need it. Um, and then, of course, in like building an explicit AST would make this 100% reliable versus like you know, 80, 90, 95% reliable, or however reliable par edit uh, and so on can be. And then the next, another next step is to, so we talked about DSLs having syntax and semantics. Actually, everything we've talked about so far, as far as Simex is concerned, is all semantics. We don't have a custom syntax for Simex. It's just using Lisp syntax at this point. But it would be nice if we could simplify the syntax, where instead of saying Simex make maneuver, Simex make move, Simex make protocol, you can just say maneuver, protocol, move, forward, backward, and you don't have to prefix everything with Simex the way that um, you know Emacs requires for functions and things like that. And so here are some references, you know, power edit, let's be evil. Gremlin is a graph traversal language. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, 
but it's just it's like a well-known graph traversal language in the world of graph databases and things like that. Um, it does any warning just help us to get out of here? Uh, Right. Oh, they're playing closing time, the song. Oh. Maybe you could just quickly wrap yeah, up. Yeah, I'll quickly wrap up. <laughs> so yeah, just check out Gremlin. It has, uh, it's a traversal language, so I think we can probably learn something from it in relation to Simex as far as traversals and things go. And uh, so the, some of the inspiration for epistemic editing is from this research that I work on, which is, you can learn more about at this site.